So talk to us about how you are envisaging a decentralized internet. What's wrong with it at the moment? Well, I, I, I think there's lots of good things about the internet. Uh, Definit is working on something called the internet computer, which extends its functionality. So the internet computer can host uh, a new breed of secure hack-proof software systems, which addresses the security problems that we see today. And it can also uh, host a new breed of open internet service, which can compete, compete with big tech and solve some of the problems we're seeing emerging. So, but is the idea here, uh, I mean, if we sort of decentralize it, uh, how exactly do we sort of structure it in a way where you can actually scale it up to the point where it's going to be just as useful as the internet today? Because right now I could go online, it's pretty seamless. I mean. So the internet is created by a protocol that right. combines uh, thousands of private networks. Mm -hmm. And the internet computer will be created by a protocol that combines thousands of data centers. So, um, you know, the hosting Who's capacity. controlling those data centers, though? Well, it's a protocol. So okay. in the same way the internet is controlled by a protocol, sure. the internet computer is created by a protocol. And that compares to something like Amazon Web Services, which is really the sort of proprietary closed infrastructure of a private company. Gotcha. You mentioned sort of taking on big tech. How do you plan to do that? Is it through cloud? I, we know Amazon Web Services has a cloud product. Microsoft Azure has a cloud product. How specifically do you sort of plan to tackle taking on big tech? So the internet computer um, makes it possible to to build uh, internet services in a different way. Um, they're called open internet services, and they're built using something called autonomous software. Um, so nobody owns an open internet service, but it's updated by a, a governance, an open governance system. And they have an advantage, or will have an advantage, because they can provide guarantees both to users and also to entrepreneurs that want to build on top of them. So today, um, there's something called platform risk stalking the world of tech. So an early example of this would have been, for example, um, Zinger. You know, Zinger is a social games company. It was very successful. It built on top of Facebook. It IPO'd. Um, its valuation was north of $10 billion. And then Facebook changed the rules. You know, the APIs that it had built on top of changed from underneath it. And, uh, you know, a few months later, Zinger had lost 85% of its value. Uh, more recently, for example, on LinkedIn, which is the business directory, um, provided APIs that hundreds of startups used to incorporate business profiles into their own services. And then LinkedIn revoked those APIs, and of course you can imagine what happened to those startups that depended upon the business profiles. The only people that kept their API access were other big tech players like Salesforce and Microsoft. So. For these reasons, you know, if you build on big tech today, you're really building on sand. Mm -hmm. And if you go to a VC and say, look, I, you know, I'm an entrepreneur, I've got this idea to create a new service, but I need to build on top of big tech, you'll likely get laughed out of the room. Mm -hmm. And even you know, the successful recent tech IPOs, I think it's 17 or 18 of the last 22, mention platform risk yeah. as being existential, an existential risk in, in their S1 filings. Right. Yeah. Um, Interested in the fact that you've been to big VCs yourself, Anderson Horowitz, Polychain Capital, and the like. How, when you explain your sort of peer-to-peer -peer internet vision, almost, how how long an investment are they looking at? When do you gain the critical mass? How do you ensure that you've got enough people involved that this becomes a reality sooner rather than later? So I, th I think all of them are long-term investors, and uh, you know we definitely believe in the potential of the internet computer and the value and the impact. It can it can produce, and you know if we didn't if we didn't create the internet computer, somebody else would, right? It's a natural evolution of the internet. You know the internet started off just provide, providing connectivity, and now it's going to be able to host secure software systems and open internet services too. So we're extending the internet. Um, the technology is available to do this. You know we're um, building on top of advanced computer science and cryptography and so on. And if we didn't do it, someone else would do it. So. People are really just backing the sort of long-term evolution of the internet and what it's going to do for us. Just real quickly, though, what, do you, what makes you think that the Googles and Amazons of the world are going to sort of relinquish their grip in any sort of way off of this? Well, they're not. I mean, I think what's going to happen is, um, you know, this, they're going to incre become increasingly monopolistic and mm -hmm. we're going to see more consolidation. Um, regulators are going to find it hard to deal with this. You know, the first attempts are things like the accept cookies dialogue you see on every website. Mm -hmm. um, you never see it, incidentally, on Facebook or Google, right? It's just every independent website now has to present the right. accept cookies dialogue. Yeah. Um, 
you know, they're not very good at fixing stuff. Uh, they let Facebook buy Instagram and WhatsApp. They let uh, Google buy Waze and more recently DeepMind, which I think will prove mm. to be a huge mistake. Um, so I, over time, though, they're going to you know, increase the level of regulation and, and, and big tech will become sort of quasi-nationalized uh, industry, which is very highly regulated. And then there'll be the free open internet. 